So good evening, everybody. My name is Tracy Evans. I am the course director at CTET, the Craniosacral Therapy Educational Trust. Uh, this is the 10th in our series of webinars that have we been holding during this lockdown time. And this evening's guest is Dr. Nicola Bruff. Um, Nicola qualified as a craniosacral therapist at the Karuna Institute back in 2006 under the guidance of Franklin Sills. She currently runs an integrative wellbeing clinic in Staffordshire in the UK and supports a wide client base specialising in um, mums and babies, children on the autistic spectrum and highly sensitive individuals. Her journey into research started 10 years ago. She first undertook a master's degree and then won a scholarship to study for a PhD at the medical um, school as part of the prestigious Warwick University. She completed her PhD in 2017. In 2018, she won the Federation of Holistic Therapists Research Award for Complementary Therapy and she's received a Services to Research Award in 2019 for her development and validation of the Warwick Holistic Health Questionnaire, the WHHQ. I'm really excited to have her here this evening and for her to share her story with you, which I think is really important for all of us as craniosacral therapists. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicola Brupp. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Tracy. Hi, thanks for having me here. It's such a privilege to be asked. Um, and hello, good evening, everybody. Um, as I say, just a real privilege to be invited by Tracy and Michael to come along and uh, share my story um, about, I guess, about myself and my journey um, with research into craniosacral therapy outcomes. Um, I thought it would be... Um, rude not to start with a short meditation so if you'd just like to get yourselves comfortable if you're not already and if you'd just like to um, join me in a few moments of stillness and settling I have to say I'm just back from a four-day postgraduate training with Franklin and Cherry Ona. So I'm feeling uh, really heart centered and yeah, really delighted. So if, if um, it's okay with you, we'll orientate ourselves to the heart um, for our starting point this evening. So if you're noticing yourself getting distracted, orientating to breath, and settling once more. And noticing what's with you in this moment. And taking your attention a little wider. And settling down back into 
your seat or however you're positioned, whatever supporting you, just resting into that support. We'll go for a minute or so longer. And when you feel ready, opening your eyes if they're closed and re-engaging. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you, Nicola. Ah, so, um, I suppose uh, first question really to start off is, um, how did your research journey begin? Yeah, um, I'd started my cranial training in 2004. And um, yeah, two-year foundation training at Karuna. It blew my mind. I just thought, wow, this is exactly where I need to be, what, you know, what I need to be doing. Um, by which time I'd already qualified as a um, CAM practitioner, if you like. So I was already offering massage and Reiki, Bowen, Bowen te uh, therapy. And um, cranial work really deepened my awareness, I guess, of, of the body. And so I was already in private practice. And when I started to orientate my work to cranial work, um, I, I, I started noticing um, just great shifts in, in the people that I was working with. And what struck me was that the shifts were usually sustained. Whereas when with other modalities, um, I could see improvements in people and, you know, clients would, you know, be really um, happy with the changes that they were noticing, but they didn't always hold, you know, there, there, there might be a reoccurrence of an old problem, um, say six months, 12 months down the line. But with the cranial work, I was just noticing there was something else happening and um, changes seemed to, yes, it seemed to um, sort of resolve quicker and um, be more sustained. So um, I went on holiday to San Francisco to visit some friends. And as I was there, the um, CSTA put out a, an email to the membership saying that they were looking for a volunteer to do some research. Now, I just remember sitting there, I think I was in an internet cafe having a, you know, having a coffee, coffee looking over um, the Bay of San Francisco. And I just heard this really little voice in my head say, I can do that. And I just sent an email, an instant reply, like two lines, said, yeah, I'm interested. Let me know, you know, what I have to do. And closed my email, completely forgot about it, never gave it another thought. And then like six weeks later, I'm sitting in Professor Sarah Stewart Brown's office in Warwick University being interviewed <laughs> for the, for the uh, role, if you like. Um, so yeah, it, that's, that's literally how it began. There was no real thought on my part, but obviously there was some bigger intention at play. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> were there any skills or was there any particular experience that you had that made you the best candidate for that role of volunteer? 
Yeah, well, I, I'd done an undergraduate degree as a mature student in European Business Administration. And as part of that degree, I spent time in the Netherlands. And I were, when I graduated, um, I sort of, in my last year, actually, I was doing some work for the Joint Aviation Authority. And as part of my dissertation, I needed to do a, a study within an organisation. And the Joint Aviation Authority had, I think, 20 member countries at the time. And one of the engineers within the organisation was looking for somebody to do some research. And they were wanting to um, do a poll across the member countries to find out um, uh, which methods they were using for cost life analysis to do with aviation. And, you know, so again, I sort of volunteered myself to do this project. Um, I think, you know, I got 300 euros, I think, for doing it at the time. Actually, it was Gilders at the time, so it was pre-euros. And um, I had to go to um, Brussels to the European Commission to present my findings and make some recommendations. So yeah, I think that must have uh, sort of, you know, sort of spoke to Sarah um, Stuart Brown, and um, she obviously thought, well, she's done something similar before on behalf of another organisation, and it wasn't a complete disaster. Um, so yeah, I think that that might have just um, been been the reason. And I think um, looking back as well, and I, and I only really realised this um, a few years ago, is that when I was working in Australia, um, I worked for a leadership management company and they had a suite of online psychometric tools. And I was a sales coordinator and it was my job to really um, make sure the uh, psychometric tests went out to recruitment uh, agents and all the... Um, uh, the licensees across Australia that were using the tools. And so in a weird way, I'd, had, I'd been around psychometric tools for like three years, and not really with a great understanding of how they were developed, but I certainly knew how they were implemented and why they were in use. Yeah. Um, so maybe again, somewhere that, you know, but at that point, of course, the idea of developing a psychometric tool wasn't even in the in my awareness, it might have been in the field, but it certainly wasn't in my awareness. So yeah, who knows? <laughs> Fantastic. So you, you embark on this um, master's degree to start with. And, yes. Um, so I just wondered, you know, in craniosacral terms, what resources did you have that you, you would draw upon to support you throughout that time? Yeah, well, I guess it... Uh, different things at different times. Um, when I started this process, um, I didn't have any children. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was quite free to come and go. I, I like to travel a lot and um, I like to horse ride. Yoga has always been my, my main go-to. Um, so yeah, being by the sea is always uh, something else that I, I quite enjoy. Um, so at different times, I've been able to do different, you know, different activities, I guess, in order to keep me well. But certainly, um, I think significant people have, have been important. I mean, I, I think, you know, now would be a good time to acknowledge David Ellis, for example. He was a past member of the CSTA council that was. And it was David's desire to demonstrate effectiveness of craniosacral therapy yeah. um, that, that pushed uh, research to the top of the agenda. Um, and so, you know, David was a real resource for me in the early days because it was his, you know, it was his baby to some degree. And also um, Judy Hemmings, who was also a council member at the time. And um, Judy... Um, has remained my clinical has been really important. So um, Vincent Winter, well, the late Vincent Winter, who was a trustee at the CSTA, Vincent was always very, very supportive of what I was doing, um, as was Amanda Biggs, the former chair. Um, and certainly, you know, my, my parents, my partner, um, and sort of as I got into the... Um, the studies, um, my, you know, my family were key because, you know, they, they donated hours and hours of um, childcare 
<laughs> for me. So, so yeah, they were the resources. And I have to say my cranial work, I remained in private practice throughout the whole of this process mm -hmm. because I knew that stillness sustained me. And to some degree, my work with my clients sustained me as well. Um, you know, although, you know, just to be really clear that I never, um, none of my own clients were ever involved in the research study because of, um, you know, introducing bias. Yes. But yeah, it was uh, the, the work itself sustained me. So, because I, that was a question, like, how did you manage that work-life balance throughout the whole of that? journey that you yeah um I'm, I'm not sure that I did <laughs> manage it uh, very well and, and I think to be honest if you were to ask my partner and my children they would say that I'm always working mm -hmm. and that I you know I was never available and never around for them um and you know it, it was an inherently a, a very stressful process um and yeah having a young family uh, alongside in parallel, you know, uh, my first daughter um, was born in 2010, just as I started the um, Masters by Research process. And uh, my second daughter was, was born just as I was applying for my PhD. So yeah, I, <laughs> there wasn't much rest <laughs> available uh, and much resource, if I'm honest. Hmm. Were, were yeah. that the biggest challenges, the lack of rest and resource, or were there other things that were challenging in that time? Yeah, I think, you know, to be honest, I've always had an intention to do my inner work um, as life happens. And, you know, I think the, some of the biggest challenges I, I had and continue to have are about my own pre and perinatal um, history and ways of being, I guess, that can disable me at times. And experiencing my own story in parallel with the birth of you know the birth and development of my daughters whilst writing my paper from what was you know the m which was the masters by research um for which i was awarded um an m m phil for outstanding work then writing you know the application for the phd with a two-year-old and a six-week-old daughter you know in in arms <laughs> Um, yeah, that was incredibly challenging. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, if I think outside of my own process to some of the really practical things like realizing partway through that I have dyscalculia, which I don't know if, for those of you that don't know is really like a dyslexia, but with numbers. And I didn't know that I had that going into this process. So when I was having to look at the quantitative element of the study that I did because I did a mixed method study I was really challenged when I had all of this awakening of my you know childhood trauma around maths and the shame and the you know the terror that I felt in equal measures around dealing with numbers um, luckily for me my best friend was a maths teacher at the time so she took me back to primary school maths every Tuesday morning. I had a maths lesson wow. to just get my confidence back with numbers before I could even look at the stats and to learn, you know, all of the um, psychometric theory that I had to wade through to be able to write my thesis and, you know, to get a handle on what I was doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess, there's, you know, there's been <laughs> more than one challenge. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think, you know, even now, I guess, um, ha despite having, you know, presented on many occasions to academic audiences, it still terrifies me. Mm. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I guess researching in the field that I that I'm in, which is complementary and alternative medicine, you know, is seen as on the fringes, really. And, you know, I think. If you think about over the last decade, in some of the challenges that CAM practitioners have had with the ASA, for example, you know, what, what claims are made on websites, you know, putting your, her, your head above the parapet or being too visible, you know, is, is quite a scary um, experience. And so I think, again, for me, if I think about my own process and um, my experience of not always feeling welcome, or um, you know, not wanting to be to be seen, 
being in an academic sort of environment just sort of fed into <laughs> fed into that in on so many levels um so yeah uh that was a challenge yeah. as well so and I, yeah with all of that with this kind of um the challenges you know not really wanting to put your head above the parapet the, the this calcular um the kind of terror that that brought and in and in you know presenting that what would you say that you have really learned about yourself through all of that well on a good day i'd say that i can do whatever i put my mind to anything is possible um and I think I recognize that I have the ability to see the bigger picture, but I have an amazing eye for detail also. So, you know, I sort of love detail, but I can really hold a vision. And I think, you know, I've proven that um, I can successfully work with a variety of stakeholders on a project whilst keeping my own integrity, because, you know, um, being involved in this project meant that I was, um, having to collaborate and liaise with the clients, with the practitioners, with the CSTA, with the university, the supervisors, you know, the external examiners and da -da, you know, so there was all these different um, responsibilities in a way throughout each of my studies that meant that um, I was constantly having to, yeah, just uh, make sure I was really clear all the time with my intentions. So I think I, I proved that I could do that. And I guess what I would say is that I'm um, my own biggest critic and I get in my own way in terms of promoting my work and being visible feels unsafe for me and exposing. So yeah, that's what I think I've, I've learned in reflection. That's, that's really interesting and, and, and then inspiring, really inspiring actually. Yeah, um, I would like now to sort of get to the research a little bit. Yeah. Um, can you outline some of the research work that you did, maybe back in the early days? Yeah. How you came up with this conceptual framework? Yeah, sure. I'm going to share my screen so that I can, can uh, work through that. Get a little bit of movement going on here. So yeah, in, in my um, first study, which was a qualitative study, um, I guess, yeah, just to, to say, when I mentioned David Ellis earlier, David's, uh, the CSTA's intention originally was to, for somebody to undertake a study of effectiveness. And they wanted to use um, a measure called the MIMOP in order to look at outcomes of CST. And um, yeah, as, I, as you heard, I said yes to that. But when I started to look at the literature and um, look at the tools that were um, available, the MIMOP obviously being one, but I knew that I would need to look right across the literature to, to look at other, other methods and other tools. It's just something didn't feel quite right to me. And again, I guess it's where I really sort of listen to this voice within um, because something was saying to me, it's the wrong place to start. Nobody's ever actually um, done any qualitative exploration into the outcomes of cranial work. And so whilst we do it on a daily basis within our practice, nobody had actually ever you know, done any research into, into that area. So. I um, renegotiated with the CSTA um, to um, you know, have their consent, if you like, and permission, um, because they were funding um, the project, to um, explore clients' experiences of cranial work so that we could really um, better understand um, what we would need to measure in future effectiveness studies. So, um, oh, there I am, look, the imposter. So <laughs> that was a, a colleague of mine in uh, my local networking group drew a cartoon of me and I just thought that would be a real nice shot for my, uh, my uh, yeah, my imposter that's with me most days. <laughs> and these are my children, Nesmi and Neola. So what are their names? Nesmi and Nesmi. Neola. And Neola. Gorgeous. 
Yeah. So this is the research overview and the phases of the development of the questionnaire. At the top of the screen, you can see um, the Masters by Research that was carried out in 2010 to 2012. So I did that on a part-time basis. And, you know, doing it part-time meant that we had two years to, to do, you know, to go through the process. Um, in theory, if you did a full-time Masters, that would be done in 12 months. And I just didn't feel that, you know, with my family situation and what we were trying to achieve, we would get all of that done and written up within a 12 month time frame. So, um, yeah, we, we took it to part time. And basically, um, we had a sample size of 29 clients. The clients were um, recruited through the CSTA membership. Um, and we, um, yeah, I did semi structured interviews with the clients and really just left it to them to tell their stories about what their their experience had been and what outcomes they attributed to having had CST. And so um, the conceptual framework um, was, was born out of um, that, that, that term study. And I guess the most important things that came out of this study was that um, the participants reported having more, more psycho-emotional awareness uh, and more awareness of mind-body links. And um, they had changes in self-concept, enhanced engagement in self-care, and uh, better capacity to manage their health problems through having better coping strategies. They reported having improved interpersonal relationships, um, feeling more connected with themselves, others in the wider environment. And overall, having an improved a uh, sense of well-being in the areas of physical, mental, relational and spiritual health. Uh, that, that paper was published in the European Journal of Integrated Medicine in 2015. Um, and when I um, presented my thesis to the external examiner, which was, um, you know, a few weeks before I gave birth to my second daughter, and, um, you know, he commented that, um, you know, he thought he was going to have to deliver my child during, <laughs> during the, uh, okay. during the um, viva, if you like. Um, you know, he gave me, I, I went out of the room and I came back in and they just said, basically, look, you can have a, you know, a, a um, you can get your master's by research here and now flying colours or you can go away, write another chapter and get an MPhil for outstanding work. It's a no-brainer. I'll go away, write another chapter. So, um, yeah, so the other chapter really was about the conceptual framework and the conceptual framework of CST outcomes. For me, the assumption with cranial work is that by fostering awareness, this will change the way individuals relate to the different aspects of themselves, mind, body and spirit, others and the environment. So where does that um, CST fit into the wider CAM community in terms of research outcomes? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think um, when we, all of the outcomes that I'll, I'll work through the conceptual framework mm. um, and, I'll, and I'll speak to that as we go, because actually, um, when you look across the literature, there was, there was evidence that outcomes were felt, um, you know, in, in people's physical bodies. They were, they were expressing, um, you know, improved states of, of mental well-being. Spirituality was spoken about, um, but in a sense of well-being, not in any great de depth. And I think what my outcomes in this study brought um, to life across the literature was this shift in um, awareness and people taking responsibility for themselves and you know engaging in um, yeah self self care in a different way? So um, what you, what you're seeing here in the um, conceptual framework, which you know I'd just like to say that in my head is um, 4D. It rotates. It's not static. Um, if you look at the top corner where there's energy levels, uh, let me just get my um, pointer. Uh, where's my spotlight? Yeah, okay. I, 
Yeah, okay. So if you look here where energy levels are, for me, you need energy to heal. Mm -hmm. So energy levels are needed right around this sphere, actually. You know, whether you're talking about mental energy, whether you're talking about physical energy, you know, whether it's about going out into the world, we need energy. And, and certainly in, in, you know, resources to heal ourselves, we need energy to do that as well. So that's why the energy levels are sitting on the outside of there. I envisage them in my mind that they're moving constantly around this sphere. And likewise, um, with the symptoms, um, sorry, likewise with the symptoms, you know, again, symptoms don't necessarily, when people present to us, um, they may be presenting lower back pain, but the origin of that may well be sitting over here somewhere in their emotions and feelings, or someone may have a, you know, a disconnect, so they, the symptoms may be linked to spiritual well-being. So again, for me, symptoms aren't in one static place on this um, uh, image. I see them weaving and moving right around into all of these domains. And of course, you know, we're not four separate domains. <laughs> all of this is integrated, but I, yeah, I was at a loss to how better to present it. So this is what, this is what we have to work with. So I'll talk to each of the areas in a little bit more depth. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, mental well-being. So again, having looked across the literature and certainly what came out of my study in regards to cranial work, people really talked about having a different mental outlook after they'd had cranial sessions. So this was this adopting new attitudes or you know coping having coping strategies, better coping strategies. Uh, there was this understanding they'd gained about the mind, body and spirit link, which they may not have had before starting. Uh, they had access to emotions and feelings that were, were not always available. Uh, you know, had a better understanding about where those emotions were coming from and learned to be accepting of them. And we're aware that there was many different sort of feeling states and that it was okay to have feelings. Um, Self-concept was, um, was in the literature already. Um, and this is really about how people perceive themselves to be, I guess, and, and, and where they come from and having a connection to their family, their history and their past. Okay. And um, you know, taking responsibility for themselves, which is around, I guess, self um, self-efficacy also you know and self-agency it's this you know there was there was a distinct um, difference from the participants who um, allowed a nurturing experience and and taking reflective downtime they were two actual distinct um, different activities um, within within the sample and autonomy you know people started to feel they were more on top or more autonomous in uh, within themselves mm -hmm. So social well-being, which, you know, I, um, as I've sort of worked with um, this conceptual framework, because it changed many times, really, to sort of, you know, as part of um, the PhD, you know, this came out of the qualitative study, but as part of my PhD, I actually had practitioners um, validate and develop this and also pr uh, clients as well. So it is a, sort of been accepted as, as a valid framework. You know, it's really about relational well-being, social well-being, and how people engaged in their lives. So, um, you know, right down to uh, whether or not they make use of a support network, whether they were feeling connected to a local community or feeling connected to family and friends, um, you know, and, and, and their intimate relationships also. So, again, these, um, the circles that you can see with a solid line um, will were um, the areas that we looked to represent in the questionnaire so that they were the, the, the key areas that we looked to cover. Mm -hmm. So spiritual well-being. Now the interesting thing about this for me was when um, we were um, doing focus groups with the practitioners, um, practitioners were really reluctant to have spiritual well-being on the conceptual framework. 
Really? It was, yeah, it was really striking, but clients were adamant that they wanted it in. It was really important to clients. Um, you know, for them, it was about their core values, um, you know, what, what their meaning of life was. Um, you know, it was about their connection to the self, divine. Animals featured quite a lot with yeah. um, the, the, the clients that took part in this uh, part of the study and, you know, their connection to nature. Um, you know, trust, faith, having compassion. Yeah, um, that's so, for, for, for people, that whole concept there of, of their connection to self and divine and faith and is huge with, with people, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, that speaks to the mystery of cranial work in a way. Um, and certainly what, you know, what's something that drives, um, you know, life, I guess. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I guess as a practitioner, I was really interested about the resistance of, of the practitioners wanting to have the um, spiritual well-being on the conceptual framework, but secretly delighted when clients were adamant that they wanted it on there. So. <laughs> Um, physical functioning again you know I guess you know people come to correct for cranial work for many different reasons and mobility posture function are usually in the mix but certainly the the things that were um, the topics that were raised as important to clients were um, you know sleep quality was always mentioned usually yeah. one of the first things that they yeah. see an improvement in um, you know getting this um, more in tune with their bodies and learning how to read signals from their bodies um, also being more comfortable with limitations and just learning to uh, I guess live with the way things are if, if there can be no real um, you know change but actually an acceptance of the limitations and how they were going to adjust their lifestyles to you know to incorporate limitations and that I think sort of freed um, clients up to have more independence as well and you know again under the physical functioning of the body we put we you know everyday life and life satisfaction it was a difficult you know difficult to know where to place these again you know all of these, I'm aware that all of these um, aspects do um, move around. Like I say, it's not static, but for, for all presenting purposes, that's where we um, presented them onto the um, framework. So yeah, just looking at it again there in its entirety, um, I guess what I notice is it's fields within fields and it's very cellular. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> looking which yeah I guess speaks to me uh, yeah. of cranial oh, work yeah. yeah yeah but in my mind it's like a torus you know yes uh, yeah. uh, you know it's it, and it's not and it's not static yeah. because you know this is like a snapshot of a, a moment yeah so great so um so Nicola um what are patient reported outcome measures. measures yeah okay well what i'm going to speak to before i go to that point is um what we're measuring actually in terms of cranial work because mm -hmm. um i think you know what's always struck me about my training is that we were always talking about inherent health mm -hmm. and i think it's it's useful for us as a field to understand where we sit in regards to the health what i call the health spectrum so if we've got disease on one end and the medical based model mm -hmm. which is always you know symptom focused looking at the disease um, it's quite reductionist when we are practicing with our clients we orientate to the health so we're always looking at what I consider the other end of the spectrum, which is well-being and looking for the health. Now, well-being is feeling good and functioning well. And good health is essential for well-being. And you can't measure well-being by asking symptom-based questions or negative questions. So when we, um, I'll get my pointer. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, here we go. Okay. Just 
just bear with me. My spotlight gone. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So when um, when we're looking across the disease from disease to symptoms in, in cranial work, I think you know for me. If I think back to what came out of the um, qualitative study, when clients talked about there being a shift in their awareness and then starting to take more responsibility for themselves, they, they're moving along the spectrum towards well-being because actually the locus of control shifts. So, you know, I think, you know, we have come from being conditioned to have a medical professional have in a position of power and they tell us what to do and I think now things are changing slightly so whereas we might have been happy to be sitting in the middle and be told oh these are your symptoms this is where you're going to end up now actually people starting to you know look for more information they're empowering themselves they're you know making lifestyle changes they you know they, they're choosing to do things differently so they're moving towards well-being on the health spectrum. So the Warwick Holistic Health Questionnaire is um, mostly positive statements and it's about well-being, measuring well-being. So I wanted to uh, be clear about that. So yeah, patient reported outcomes. So patient reported outcomes take into account the patient's view and their perspective about their health and well-being. So when I said about, um, you know, my hunch early on that, um, you know, the MIMOC wasn't uh, the best tool for us, yes, yes. Um, I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that because pre the qualitative study, we didn't have any evidence to say what clients attributed um, as positive outcomes or any outcomes uh, in regards to cranial work outside of the anecdotal evidence that we get within practice. Mm. So having done this, you know, undertaken that study, um, what I did was um, took the qualitative state statements from the interviews that I did and brought as many as those forward as I could onto the questionnaire so that actually we have got a patient reported outcome measure, which is um, you know, the tool, if you like, the questionnaire that is used to gather the data from the outcomes. So you know, traditionally, um, questionnaires were developed by clinicians for clinicians. Mm -hmm. And you know, in recent sort of, I would say the last perhaps 15 years or so, certainly the last decade, there's, you know, patient voice is important yeah. to hear from patient, about the patient experience. Mm. So, um, you know, this is what we now have is a patient reported outcome measure for CST and the wider field of complementary medicine. That's great. I mean, why do you think it's important that we evaluate what we do? Yeah, I mean, gosh, the, the list is the list is endless, really, about why 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 to do that. I think it's many it's me, there's many reasons and on many levels. I think we can look at it from an organisation perspective. We can look at it from a practitioner perspective, and we can look at it from a client's perspective. And I think as an organisation or as a field of work. Really, it's about validating what we're doing and, um, you know, evaluating the intervention that we offer and um, demonstrating that we're using rigorous techniques to do that and building an evidence base because it builds confidence. And it's, um, you know, when, when we're trying, I guess, you know, when, when we're trying to present what we do to the, you know, out there in the world, it's really important that we can have evidence to, to come back to and say, well, you know, cranial work has been demonstrated to be, um, you know, useful for migraines, for example, or tinnitus or whatever, um, you know, condition um, we might be working with. And unless we are gathering evidence, we, you know, we don't have that that um, ground in a way to you know to fall back on 
So yeah, it's, it's all about, I think, um, raising the profile of the profession and to be seen to be professional yeah. and to yeah. be um, also safe also for, you know, for the general public. Yes. And, on a, and on a practitioner level, you know, it's about, um, again, demonstrating to um, your clients that you are using a systematic way to measure their outcomes. Mm. You know, and having um, a benchmark to come back to that's, that's the same benchmark um, and being consistent with that. And I think, you know, it, it, again, it speaks of professionalism. It's a way of measuring your impact. It's a way of, um, you know, checking out whether cranial work is working in your practice over and above massage that you might be doing. Mm. You know, there's many different layers uh, and reasons why you would do it. And from, a, and from a client's perspective, you know, it's an opportunity for the client to, um, you know, communicate their, their, the way they're functioning and the way they're feeling. And it's, you know, it it's also um, supports them in being more proactive in, in self-care if they can see the changes that are happening or when they've plateaued, um, you know, that can be really useful for, for clients. Yeah, and definitely. I... I Sorry, I recognise that it's not appropriate for all, but similarly, it can, it can be a real useful um, talking point also, yeah, for clients when, when working with them. Yeah, it's something that was often asked, you know, when people come into the profession around, you know, is there any evidence base for this? Is there any research going on? I'm sure. It's certainly in, in teaching, a lot of students wanting to get involved with some research, but not knowing quite how to do it or where to go with that. So, yeah. I mean, with that in mind, can you tell us a bit about the questionnaire, the Warwick Holistic Health yeah, Questionnaire? questionnaire. And yeah, sure. sure. Absolutely. Like I said, it's a measure of well-being and the, the domains that you saw on the conceptual framework. So the, um, the statements on the questionnaire, there's 25 statements and they cover, you know, mental, physical, social, relational and spiritual well-being. Um, it takes around five minutes to complete. It gives us a tangible outcome, you know, one number at the end is a total score. It's really easy to add up. It can be used in different settings. It can be used for different therapies and, inter and interventions. And it can be used to measure different types of presenting problems as well. Um, the longitudinal pro process and change can be measured. Um, it's for, predominantly it is for adults because that was the sample uh, in which we, we tested and developed it with. And the important thing is it's responsible uh, it's responsive, sorry, at chain, at, to change at group and individual level. So that means that when you use it as a private practitioner within your practice, if you say, for example, had a client um, complete the questionnaire and they scored 60 um, on, the, on the questionnaire the first time they came, and then the second time they were um, filling in the questionnaire and they you know, um, filled in 65, you can take it that the questionnaire is responsive on an individual level. So there is an improvement there with that individual. And when you start to um, look at collecting data, say within, a, within your practice, so if you were looking overall, if you had like a, say 30 clients, for example, um, you can look across the 30 clients and the, you know, you can say at that point, whether there's a significant a statistical significance across that group, um, you know, because the questionnaire is responsive um, to change at group level as well. Yeah. So, so, you know. Yeah, it, I was just saying that with different groups as well, you could probably identify certain patterns that are moving that's within. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, for me, this is really exciting because we haven't had a tool like this before um, and what excites me even more is that we you know we did it with a, a sample of cranial clients and you know practitioners were involved in the development so you know I guess what's key is that um, you know I followed gold standard methods to develop it it was a mixed method study so we took the like I say the qualitative conceptual framework 
then we, you know, we worked through um, lots of different layers, involvement with clients, involvement with practitioners, which has meant that the face validity and the content validity, so that means basically the con content and the statements are liked by clients and are liked by practitioners. And for me, the important thing there is that, you know, I see practitioners as gatekeepers because if practitioners don't like this questionnaire, clients are never going to see it. So it was really important for me to get the, you know, um, approval, if you like, uh, and buy-in of practitioners. And that's why it was really important for have practitioners involved in, in the development and evaluation of it. So it's exciting. So, you know, what is the vision then to take this forward and how can we get involved? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly for me, again, I think um, my vision is to get the practitioners and our profession evaluating their practice. And that can be done one practitioner at a time. Um, you know, and I, I think it can be done um, within private practice and it can be done on an organization level. So if, for example, um, you know, the CTET, for example, with their, their low cost clinic, if they wanted to you know, implement the questionnaire within the clinic, that would be one way of looking at it from an organizational perspective. I think looking at the bigger picture, if um, you know, some of the membership organizations wanted to um, you know, use and implement um, the questionnaire within their membership, and they wanted to um, you know, um, collaborate with a collective um, you know, data collection, you know, there's so many ways that we can do it, but certainly for me, it can be really simple as one practitioner and one client at a time, and we do it slowly, slowly, or we can, you know, get a panel together, we can come up with a strategy and work out as a whole field of work, how we can take it forward and what, you know, what the best use of resources and time and effort um, are to do that. And of course, you know, there will be training required on how to do clinical evaluation, um, but I'm happy to, you know, to spearhead that and, and offer the training. So, yeah, I just think now, as the, you know, the time is now. I think all of these things, you know, um, happen in the divine right timing when it when it's uh, you know when it's the, the right time. And I think, yeah, you know, from an organisation's perspective, um, you know, I think they need to be thinking about. Um, you know, having an implementation lead, looking at data management support and how they get the practitioners involved, um, you know, look at the design, so how the data be collected, you know, setting up systems and processes, um, such as, um, you know, a database or a spreadsheet, um, and, you know, sharing the results with the referrers into that system. Um, and like I say, training practitioners and supporting them in the process. So for me, it's almost like I've got 10 years of this work behind me, but I feel that we're actually just at a starting point and there's more work to be done. But, you know, I, I certainly see this um, just taking our profession to another level. So we're coming up to sort of, we've been on for a, almost an hour now, yep. um, Nicola. So um, what we'll do is if we open up the, Lord, to some questions. Yeah, sure. Um, if I go to the um, chat, let's just have a little look. Uh, question here from Susan. Um, where was the study published in 2015? Yeah, hi, Susan. It was in the European Journal of Integrated Medicine. It is actually on the uh, CSTA website and it's available i think on the public pages but i'm happy to make um, that available as well i can send a link through for that paper afterwards great um jill here would like to know how long had the subjects been receiving cst when you interviewed them yeah they varied the majority of them were um I'd been using cranial work for a longer period of time. There was, a, there was very few that had, had had, well, the, 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 the inclusion criteria was that they had to have had a minimum of six sessions to be involved in the study. So um, yeah, they'd all had at least six sessions and some had been 
having cranial work um, on an ongoing basis, for, you know, for quite a number of years. Um, okay, so question from DH. The health spectrum doesn't seem to reflect accurately reality. A patient can have many diseases and still experience true well-being. Thus, it is not a linear spectrum, but multidimensional. So the question is, is that captured by this conceptual framework in any way? Um, I think I, you know, I hope I made it clear that that was a static um, snapshot. And absolutely, you're right in all of your statements, of course. But the reality of it is, is that we don't have any means of measuring. And if we are to um, match ourselves as other professionals do, and we try and, um, how can I say, uh, evaluate in the same way that the you know the NHS do for example or physios do as example you know as an example we you know we need to be measuring in the same way that they do so yeah I agree you know health is not static and when you fill in a questionnaire you're actually asking somebody to you know the questionnaire has a recall period of two weeks so you're asking them to reflect on how they felt over the last two weeks and it's that moment, actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you're also asking about well-being, which is a subject, subjective experience. So that is also changing moment by moment and daily. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. But, you know, this is what we've got. This is how psych psychometric tools work. Um, yeah. Um. A question from Renato, did recognition of and impact from environmental factors come in to the study and any symptoms correlation? The qualitative study is the referring to. I don't know, in the study, that's right. So um, I, I guess if you're talking about environmental factors, if you're talking about the, um, you know, the psychosocial demo, de, you know, demographics of, of an individual, then yes. Um, but you know, with with the way that a semi-structured interview goes, you you know, you really are leaving it open for the um, participant to talk about what's important to them. You don't sort of steer them too much. You use a, a topic guide. Um, to help navigate them but really it's about what they you know they shared what was important to them so yeah what's reported in the paper is really um, based on you know the client's experiences. Um, an anonymous one here can you give us some examples of the sorts of questions which you can find on the questionnaire? Yeah good, that's a good question so um, you can go to my thesis so I can't, you know, ideally it would be great to be able to show you the questionnaire, but I can't for licensing purposes. But what you can do is download my thesis from the website, which you'll get the address for in a minute. And on um, page 177, you can see the list, um, but the questionnaire looks very, very different now. So for example, um, I've been in pain is, you know, one of the uh, statements. Um, I felt able to take care of myself. I felt engaged in life. Um, my awareness about my health has helped me manage life. Now, these, that statement is really important because it's in quite a new concept in health ev healthcare evaluation because it demonstrates engagement mm -hmm. and people taking self, you know, taking responsibility for themselves. So. Yeah, so that's quite a new concept. Uh, I've been sleeping well is another. So yeah, what, what we saw on the conceptual framework, the, the um, items on the outer um, sphere, they were the, um, I guess they are the ones what, that I sort of uh, made sure that items were related to on the, on the questionnaire. A question here from Cynthia. Uh, can the WHHQ be used with other modalities or even to compare the efficacy of various modalities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm saying yes, no reason why not. Um, with my academic hat on, I would need to say, well, it hasn't been tested in other modalities. 
But of course, when a questionnaire is let out into the world, people will choose to use it how they want and with whatever modality they want. Um, certainly, um, you know, um, for example, the Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which um, Professor Sarah Stuart Brown developed sort of over 15 years ago, that has been used internationally. It's been translated into over 20 or 30 languages. Um, and it's used across many, many different settings. Now, it was, you know, it was never developed for all of that. <laughs> but like I say, when something goes out in the world, you can't really prevent, you know, sort of prevent it from being used if people are going to use it in whichever way they can. And for me, because I developed this for CST, um, essentially, that's what I'm interested in. But it's actually um, been piloted at the moment in one of the NHS foundation trusts for other modalities within an oncology department. So I guess I'll be able to answer that question with a little bit more, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, watch the space. Yeah, yeah, watch the space for that one. Um, similar question here from a couple of people. Ursula would like to know, can the questionnaire be used by anybody? And where can one find it? And also, um, Janet would like to know, how do we go about registering for you with ind for individual training? And if they'd like to use the questionnaire as our own prom in our own clinical research, where do they find this information? Yeah, so if they go over to uh, go.warwick.ac.uk forward slash WWHHQ, um, that's the university website and there's um, some information on there about how to register. Um, you will have to put a slide at the end. We'll yes. pop that up. That yeah. Up. Yeah. So you will need to register for use and you will have to purchase an annual license. And that is going to be available in the coming weeks. I'm hoping my fingers are crossed. Um, so there's one here. Um, 29 didn't seem a very large sample for clients. How were they selected to be representative? That's a, an anonymous ask. Yeah, well, with qualitative studies, it's not about numbers of participants. It's about the quality of the data. So qualitative all is all about um, the density and the richness of the data. You don't, it's not about big sample sizes. It's really quantitative um, studies where the, the larger numbers get more about representation. So really with qualitative, you're looking at themes. We use thematic analysis to um, do the analysis, to analyze the data. And, um, you know, you, you look at a, a sort of across cases, if you like. So that's, yeah, so it's uh, not relevant in, in terms of qualitative. Um, so Bernard asked, how would you go about translating the questionnaire into other languages? I'm yeah, you... a practitioner in a non-English speaking country. Yeah, sure. Um, well, at this moment in time, that wouldn't be possible um, because uh, you would need obviously a license in the first instance. And then there is a, an academic protocol to follow. It's not a chance. It's not a case of, um, you know, literally somebody just going down and translating it. You have to have back translations and it has to be tested within um, a local population as well. So it's quite a process and quite a lot of um, resource required to do that so it's not I'm not saying it's not possible of course it is or you know somebody else would need to take on the cost of that and the the time and uh, yeah to, to do it yeah um, a question here around the children I noted that you, you named it was um, the study originally wasn't with children so the yeah. question was were children and babies evaluated in the study as well as adults and yeah. is there any difference in response time to treatment for babies or young children well, I mean, they weren't um, involved or included in the study because um, the ethics um, with the university really, you know, uh, and also with the ethics of the cranial, you know, the CSTA at the time was certainly that we work with, um, as adults, I guess, a 16 plus. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't appropriate for mums and babies and, and children in, in, in this context. Um, but in terms of response times, I guess I can only speak from my, my experience as a practitioner that babies and children always respond quicker than adults. I hope that's useful. Um, question from Mark here. 
were the subjects in the study allowed to see other practitioners or use other modalities at the same time? And if so, how could you attribute their well-being claims to BCST? It's, again, it's whether he's referring to the um, qualitative study or whether he's referring to the development of the WHHQ. With the, um, the qualitative study, we did ask participants whether or not they were seeing other practitioners. Um, it was more about getting a sense of um, what, what, what they were doing really to, to, take, to take care of themselves. And again, that, that information is available in the paper, but more in depth in my thesis, my MPhil thesis, which is also, well, which is available actually on the um, Craniosacral Therapy Association website. <coughs> so yeah, you can find out more information from having a read. Um, practical question here. Does the questionnaire have to be done on computer? Does the client fill it in or can the practitioner ask questions and note the client's score? That's from Linda. Yeah, hi Linda. It's a patient reported outcome measure, so the patient completes it themselves. It's only in paper format at the moment. I did do some um, work at um, evaluating an online version, so we have done that. Um, but again, really, um, it's a prom, so it's it's always it's not it's not to be administered, if you like, by the practitioner. It's really about the um, questionnaire being completed by the client. But again, I appreciate that you know some in some circumstances people will do what they do. But yeah, it's developed for completion by the patient or the client. Um, so S. Walker would like to know, does completing the questionnaire bring up more questions from the client? Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes. And I mean, I can only speak from my own experience, I guess, of, of having started to use it within my own practice and within the clinic. Um, you know, what I found is that, you know, clients are very compliant, <laughs> actually you know you um you ask them to fill something in and they and they fill it in um and, you know like joking aside but yeah sometimes it does but but you know i think if you've um i think it, it depends on you know this is something that i discuss in the training actually because i think you know we have to be really sensitive in the way that we um pre, pre, you know request someone complete a prom um, and I think it, it depends on when it's been completed, whether you're doing it, um, you know, before they come to clinic even, or whether, whether they're doing it when they arrive and you're doing it in the waiting room or whether you're doing it with them while you're sitting in the chair opposite them. You know, it, it can be many different experiences. I mean, my preference in the way that I do it is I, I let the um, client complete the questionnaire whilst, whilst they're in my room but I'll go off and get water or I'll go and wash my hands or you know because it, it prevents that um, desire to engage and to ask and to you know actually if you leave them with it they work through it and it's yeah it's fine yeah uh, a question here from Sarah would you hope to be involved with anyone utilizing the WHHQ tool or can it be utilized individually yeah, no, um, it can be utilised individually. I don't um, wish to be involved. I'm hoping that hundreds of people are going to be really enthused and want to use it. And I, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't want to be <laughs> dealing with uh, all, of, all of that. So no, um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fine for people to um, take it within their own practice and, and uh, work away. Yeah. Um, Alison would like to know, will this be available to use for Irish um, CSTs? Sure. Yeah. I mean, really, there's no restriction on where in the world it goes. Um, it's really for English speaking countries. So at the moment, obviously, because it's in English language. Um, but yeah, there, there won't be any restriction on it. Um, Susan, just asking for some clarification here. Were the clients given the questionnaire prior to treatment to establish what problems they were having and to compare it following treatment? Yeah. So again, I think... Um, the, you know, this is sort of something that I speak to in the training because, you know, when you are asking um, what, how can I say, let's start again. So it, it's useful to determine what you're evaluating, obviously. 
So if you, um, you know, you, if, if someone's coming for you for back pain, then, you know, you know, you're making a note in your, in your, your own notes, if you like, and in your client notes that you're, back, you're evaluating for back pain and you ask them to complete the questionnaire because on the questionnaire, they won't be asked about their back per se, what they're being asked about is their overall well-being in regards to the physical, mental, spiritual, relational and, uh, you know, social well-being. So, um, you know, it's up to you to gather that other information in order to put the, um, the results, if you like, of the questionnaires into context when you uh, report, report your results or disseminate your results, if you're going to use them in that way. So are there, um, Robert's asking, are there plans to check with particip participants in say one to five years to assess longer term efficacy? Yeah. I mean, again, I think, you know, if we take a, um, a professional approach or a profession approach and we have a collaboration and some of the organisations decide that they want to take, you know, drive a um, initiative forward, I think absolutely we need to be doing that. Um, but, you know, within practice, uh, as a practitioner, again, I think, you know, if, yes, you can also do that. But I think really, if we're looking at longitudinal studies, it'd be better to be doing it as a collaborative and to, to do it as, um, you know, a group of practitioners or, you know, a couple of organisations taking that on and do it strategically. Yeah. Um, Susan would like to know, is training virtual or online? Um, it, it will be online, I guess, at the moment. Um, yeah, I have run um, sessions face-to-face pre-COVID. Um, but yeah, for now, it would need to be online. But, you know, I think, yeah, it works. It'll, it'll be fine. So, yeah. Um, Ursula's naming that she's been using my mock for a few years. Can you give a hint of the difference between the two questionnaires? Sure, sure. So my mock, um, obviously, you're, it, it's a individualized questionnaire. So your um, client can choose the symptoms in which you know it wants to evaluate on on every session, and I guess. What I know from my own experience and what I recognize um, within the field is the analysis is really, really challenging because you're not getting consistent, you're not evaluating the same um, symptoms. So it can be a bit of a nightmare when you're trying to analyze and disseminate the information using the mind map. I think it works fine in an from an individual perspective. Um, obviously it's, you know, it's been around for, you know, since the late nineties and it's been, you know, uh, adopted. Um, but I also know there's challenges when you come to try and use it in a, um, say a group setting or with bigger, um, populations. It, yeah, it's, it's, um, how can I say it has some limitations in terms of what it can actually, the effectiveness it can demonstrate, um, and it hasn't been psychometrically validated either due to, it, due to its design. Interesting. Um, another anonymous one here. Were you required to have any medical background in order to do the postgraduate degrees in health science? Or what advice would you give to people interested in advancing research in this field? Yeah, no. Um, again, I, I hadn't got um, any medical um, training to do this um, you know, to do the postgrad in health sciences. But, you know, I think, you know, if you were to, have, I think, again, it's about finding a supervisor that you that, that can work with you. And because I was applying my um, research in a real life setting, so to speak, um, that I guess that was, and, and because I'd got an undergraduate degree, so I could demonstrate that I had the skills to, you know, to, to do, um, to do uh, research and to um, learn, if you like. Um, yeah, it, I, I didn't need the qualifications, but, you know, having worked through, I think, um, yeah, it's, you know, I've worked through one of the highest academic accolades that you can receive. So it demonstrates that I have a good mind and I have the skills and ability to, you know, to work at that level. So, yeah, I, 
I don't know what else to say about that really. I just think, and you know, if you want, I think it's really, I think that the important thing to understand about, you know, your training, doing postgraduate, you know, postgraduate trainings and research is that you're, you're learning to um, have critical appraisal skills. You're learning to how to undertake a research process and you're learning how to, um, you know, scrutinize literature you know, there's so many skills involved. It isn't necessarily about the subject. It's really about the, the, the skills that you're developing and, and, and learning through that process. So I think, you know, yeah, it's really challenging, but I think if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> um, so we'd like to know, did you encounter any resistance <coughs> from clients who maybe didn't want to take responsibility for their well-being? And she thinks the framework and concept of evaluating our profession is an excellent idea. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, no, not, I guess this was, you know, this is, I suppose, one of the inherent biases within the study. We had people who were happy to talk about their experience of cranial work. You know, we may not have had people that, you know, didn't have a good experience, get, you know, want to get involved. So, yeah, it's a difficult question to ask. Certainly, um, I think, yeah, it, it wasn't something that I, you know, that I recall as being the case within the study because I think, yeah, people actually were really happy to share their experiences and they'd mainly had positive experiences. Um, there's quite a nice note here from, from Celia. Celia Jennings, who was part of the council uh, that voted to, to support you at the time. Yeah. Um, can you somehow let us have the abstract and conclusion of the paper? I'm really fascinated about what worked for you to complete this gargantuan task for the world of CST. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, the paper is, like I say, out in the public domain, really, anyway, because the, I'm assuming you're talking about the qualitative paper. But um, in terms of the validation work for the, for the WHHQ, the final draft is sitting on my PC, ready to be sent for submission. <laughs> you know, I think um, you can't rush a good job, you know. Um, is that why it was... 2017 that I submitted my thesis and uh, January 2018 when I actually got my graduation and my certificate but it just takes time and energy to you know work through to pull a paper together and yeah I've, I've been working on the paper um, whilst yeah setting up my clinic in Staffordshire and being a mom and it just takes yeah, time longer than I would have liked but yeah the paper's almost there and I'm hoping to submit that sort of certainly before um before September so you know one, again once that's published I'll make it um widely available but you can um see the abstract um within my thesis which you can download from the um, website that you can see in front of you and what was the title of the paper? The um, qualitative paper was the um, pers oh, perspectives. Oh, what was it? The perspective. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. I wrote that in 2015. <laughs> it's something along the lines of perspectives of CSD users, um, mechanisms and yeah, me mechanisms of CST. Yeah, something like that. I'm just going to do a brief ch uh, time check here. We've got about five minutes or so left. Uh, lots of nice uh, um, comments here. I just want to check the website. A couple of people asking, is there two? Oh, oh no, there isn't two. Sorry, that's mis misspelling my, my fault. Yeah, no, it's just one. Two W's in, in yeah. more there, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and a few people just asking... Uh, for you to talk a little bit about your own experience of um, if you can share some of the unexpected things you found about how BCST helps people, perhaps just a little bit about your own practice. Um, how, hmm, good question. Yeah, I know, you know, I think what always amazes me is 
um, I guess people perceive that we're not doing anything. And well, you're not, you know, certainly I guess I can speak mostly around, say, when I'm working with babies or when I'm working with autistic children and I'm working in the field predominantly and not putting my hands on, you know, and mum's, you know, so it's that mum's sort of expectations that there's going to be some physical something happening, something visual happening. And quite often, you know, we know that that isn't how this work happens. So, yeah, I think... Um, even sometimes I get amazed, you know, at how working in the field and orientating to the long tide can, can make these amazing shifts within babies and children. Um, yeah. In very, very short time. So, yeah, I think in my own practice, that's what I see. And I think that's what I guess I get reflected back in my clients because there's, it's that non-doing that actually there's always something happening underneath that, that just blows them away. And I think, you know, I think once, I think once you've been touched in, in this way, you know, in a relational way, it's difficult to go anywhere else because I think there's something about the way that we work speaks to people on, on a deeper level that, yeah, just opens doors for people. Uh, and I guess that's what I see on a regular basis with my clients. Yeah. Um, there is just one final question here, actually, Nicola, because it, it's come through from Andrew and he'd actually sent, emailed it through earlier, which is, okay. is there any collaboration with the Hawk Health Project? Yeah, no, not at the moment. Um, I, I'm aware of, obviously, we QDOS and aware of um, uh, the, for, the work that um, Claire Ralton did with the homeopaths with the Making Cases Count using the MIMOP. Um, but no, not at the moment. We're not looking to, to do anything there yet. Um, but we, you know, I have been, uh, in discussions with, um, the, uh, they've just changed the name, the integrative health. Uh, I just, the, yeah, the name escaped me. So it's the, the, um, all parliamentary group. I know that they are looking to do some evaluation across different modalities. So um, certainly may be involved in, in that in some way. And, and uh, for me, um, I think it would be great if we could get cranial work involved in that. And also, you know, with the, the WHHQ being used in that as well. So. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Nicola, so much for your time and your energy, not just for this evening and being brave on taking such a massive task on to further the validation of our work and um i think we will owe you a huge debt actually and you know i highly encourage us all to take up the baton now and to help take it forward and to get some real validation there for our profession um i think it's it's so valuable and it's so great to have you up here and talking about it i don't think we've had enough of you uh, visible over the last uh, few years to kind of bring this about so people can start to get an understanding of what it is and what we can do now sure. as practitioners. So um, it's been just an enormous pleasure chatting with you this evening. Thank you. And Thank is, you. Is there any last words or anything you'd like to say before we, we close? Yeah, I think had I have known what journey I was going to be going on, <laughs> I may not have listened to that little voice <laughs> within <laughs> that I can do that. Um, because yeah, I guess when you're going through something, you know, yeah, it's difficult, I guess, to step outside of it, but now I've had a bit of breathing space and I can reflect back on the journey in the past 10 years and getting, you know, getting the questionnaire thus far and knowing that actually for many it is a starting point. Yeah. It, I, I'm, I'm excited and I'd actually feel quite proud of, of what um, not just I've achieved, because I think, you know, bearing in mind that lots of practitioners um, and lots of their clients have been involved in this along the way, hundreds in fact. Um, so, you know, I, I want to acknowledge them and, and acknowledge the CSTA as well for their, um, you know, um, resources into this in the first place. And yeah, just thank you for giving me the opportunity this evening and the platform to to share a little bit uh, about it. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank um, you. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen and yes. then I'll put up some other um, slides for everyone. Um, 
So um, there we have your information coming up again. Yes. Um, yeah, just huge thanks to you, Nicola. And um, to everybody who's here this evening, thank you for being here. Um, I'd just like to say this is the last in our series of webinars uh, for now. I'd like to thank all the guests that we've had over the last um, four months. Uh, Yat Vandeval, Jim File, Nicholas Handel, Ian Wright, Mary Bolingbrook, Sarah Nesling, Franklin Sills, Joe Cool, Edwina Gray, and of course, Dr. Nicola. Um, it's, you know, they've so generously given their time and their energy and their attention, and uh, I'm truly grateful for that. Thank you all as well for being here um, and uh, being with us over these last four months. It's truly been a pleasure to host these for you, and we really hope that you found them um, interesting, informative, and inspirational.